So this video in the evidences section was inspired by a recent trip I took to the Kirtland area and while visiting the church history sites we were at the Isaac Morley farm and as we were pondering over the history of the church there I realized and dawned on me that the revelation that Joseph Smith received for Isaac Morley to go to Missouri essentially evicted Joseph from the property. That's where Joseph was living and it dawned on me uh, this was a great evidence of Joseph being a prophet. If he was a fraudulent prophet, why would he want to uh, give a revelation like that that would force him to, to move? And in fact, he ended up having to move out quite a ways from uh, the main uh, place in Kirtland there, out to Hiram, Ohio, with the John Johnson uh, farm took him in. Um, it made me think also while I was out there, during the Kirtland Safety Society crisis, I'll do a separate video on that at some point, um, but in this darkest time of apostasy in 1837, Joseph sent some of his most faithful brethren that you would think he'd want to surround himself with, uh, Heber C. Kimball uh, particularly, um, Orson High, Joseph Fielding, he sent uh, a number of other brethren out to Great Britain uh, on missions. And they were extremely successful. They baptized 2,000 people in eight months and really laid the groundwork for the Twelve to go forth um, on their missions just two years later, bringing the church membership to 6,000 there. And it's really what saved the church as the, those saints came to, to uh, Nauvoo and added uh, great strength to the church in, in many different ways. Um, and then I thought about the some, many of the scriptures that Joseph included in the revelations that were... Um, essentially detrimental towards Joseph would be embarrassing. If you were a fraudulent prophet, you would not want to include some of these. So as an example, DNC 3, when, after Joseph had the lost manuscript, the 116 pages of Martin Harris, verses 6, 7, and 8, it says, And behold, how oft you have transgressed the commandments and the laws of God, and have gone on in the persuasions of men. For behold, you should not have feared man more than God, although men said it not the counsels of God and despised his words. Yet ye should have been faithful, and he would have extended his arm and supported you against all the fiery darts of the adversary, and he would have been with you in every time of trouble. DNC 5, verse 21, And now I command you, my servant Joseph, to repent and walk more uprightly before me, and to yield to the persuasions of men no more. And I'd like to share three other uh, examples from the Doctrine and Covenants. DNC 64, Verse 7, Nevertheless, he has sinned, but verily I say unto you, I, the Lord, forgive sins unto those who confess their sins before me and ask forgiveness who have not sinned unto death. To be clear, the he has sinned was referring to, to Joseph in the earlier verse. DNC 90, verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, Verily, verily, I say unto you, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee according to thy petition, for thy prayers and the prayers of thy brethren have come up into my ears. In the last one, DNC 93, verse 47, And now verily I say unto you, Joseph Smith, Jr., you have not kept the commandments, and must needs stand rebuked before the Lord. I'm sure there are many other examples we come up with. I just wanted to share a few different ideas that I received as I was uh, pondering over this message while visiting the sites in Kirtland.